is one of the sort of a big topic coming out from the survey. Uh, can you sort of break that down for us in terms of what that means, uh, loss of control? I think some people may think that it's uh, about fairness, you know, of the, um, uh, some of the outputs generated by the AI, it's about uh, explainability, it's about accountability. Can you break that down for us? Yeah, so we have the concept of a human at the helm. Uh, and really, we see AI as being able to supercharge and to complement humans. And we've developed our Office of Ethical AI to make sure when we introduce this AI technology, we do it with accuracy, we do it with trust, we do it in a sustainable way, and we do it with transparency. So the transparency, I think, is important because you, know, you need to be able to, to build that relationship with your customer. And companies spend a lot of time and effort building a trusted relationship with the customer. If you're now going to break that relationship by putting an AI bot in and making that person feel like you're talking to a real person, but in effect you're not, that breaks that trust. So we want to make sure that when we're implementing AI, we're doing it with the human at the helm and the human in control. And AI is really that complementary um, uh, addition and to make sure we're being very transparent to a customer and make sure we're, we're, we're sort of... Um, uh, grounding it in really good quality data so it's accurate. So what do you think is the, some of the major things that organizations can do to you know, help users, help employees, help um, you know, customers see that it is a complementary tool? What is missing at the moment when it comes to education that gives people this sense of fear that it's taking away their jobs? Well, I think the human at the helm is important. So back to the survey, 94% don't trust, uh, currently trust AI to operate without a human intervention. And I think that's important, right? We, I, I talk to customers who, who say, I want to link up my, my chatbot directly with a large language model. And I say, well, hang on a minute, right? You need to be able to have that human being able to see what the AI is doing, certainly for a while, and being able to be a human at the helm and controlling, controlling the interactions going forward. You also need to make sure that you ground your AI on trusted data. So this morning in the keynote, we talked about the difference between consumer AI and enterprise AI. And in consumer AI, data has come from a variety of different sources. It got scraped from the internet. So some of it's good quality, and as we know, the internet also contains some pretty shocking stuff as well. So all of this has gone into these large language models. What Salesforce is doing is making sure when we use those large language models, we don't utilize the large language models for the data that they're holding. We utilize it for its large language capability, for its ability to generate content, but we ground the prompts in trusted customer data securely to make sure that we get the accuracy around there. So back to the education, people need to understand, and I know you know a lot of what I'm talking about is technical, but people need to be able to understand how the AI is working at this level so that they can get confidence that the data that is coming in is being taken from the right source, that it's accurate, that it's trustworthy. And AI also needs to be use case driven. So, you know, we go through these things with technology all the while that technology comes out and we find a purpose for the technology. And Gen AI hit the scene tremendously quickly. And when you look at it, the benefits are clear. But many companies rushed into it without working out what the use cases that they were trying to do. And as a result, the AI was generated in a way that wasn't really helping the business. I think if you take a use case driven approach and you try to work out what are the best use cases for generative AI, you make sure you go through the adoption with, with your organization on why AI is beneficial. You do the reassurances around, you know, this is not replacing you, this is complementing you. And you make sure that they understand that it's grounded in proper trusted customer data that will really help AI adoption. Um, you talked about uh, securing data, and of course, uh, security and privacy is also some of the big elements when it comes to trust in AI. Can you talk a little, and of course, this is a security uh, podcast. Can you talk a little bit about you know, the security and privacy aspects when it comes to trust in AI? Absolutely. I mean, you know, ironically, cu uh, you know, customers and organizations have spent, you know, over the last decades, millions and millions and millions securing customer information, customer confidential company information, firewalls, security processes, passwords, you know, blocked out systems. So we spend a huge amount of money controlling and securing our personal information, our customers' personal information, our company confidential information. Suddenly, these large language models come along from companies that, to be honest, have only been around for a year or so or less or come even a few months. And initially, companies were sort of very much throwing their data across to these models. Uh, and it was you know, almost like the Wild Wild West. You were taking these things that you'd spent a lot of money protecting, and suddenly you were pumping it into this large language model somewhere on the internet with the company you didn't really understand.
understand. I didn't even understand what you were doing with it. And that's why Salesforce built our trust layer first. Before we rolled out our generative features, we built our trust layer because trust is our currency. Number one value and without trust, we don't have a business. So we built our trust layer to do a number of things. Firstly, it masks PII data. So when the data leaves Salesforce, it is masked. Mm -hmm. So when it goes across to a large language model, Gavin is replaced with you know, a hash or whatever the algorithm is. Um, and my date of birth or details of whatever it might be, account number. So we make sure that doesn't go across to the LLM first. Secondly, we make sure we connect to the LLM for a secure gateway, so we have contracts in place on how we can connect. Thirdly, we Im implement zero retention with our LLM partners. So we're not using the customer's data to help train their model. And we're very clear that customer's data is their data. It's not Salesforce data. It's not our, our LLM partner's data. So we have contractual obligations that they cannot use this data to train their model, that they use it, they generate the re response, and then they forget about it. Uh, and then we do toxicity and bias detection to make sure that when these things come back, we look for hallucinations and bias, and we strip that out or alert customers uh, when there's problems coming back. So there's a whole process around. Um, and, and another point is around how AI has access to data. So traditionally, if you take a bank, right, you don't have a customer service agent, can't see everybody's account. They can't do every process. They, there's access controls on what you can see, what you can't see. At this level, you can see this. At this level, you, can't, you can see that. We want to make sure that we implement those access controls and that data governance with AI as well. So AI can't see everything. We can control the data that AI can see and can't see. And without those sort of trust and that governance and those, those security layers, you really end up taking this new technology, plugging it straight in, giving it access to all the data, access to external solutions, and that's where the security and privacy concerns come in. And we've seen some of this happen. We've seen companies who have employees have used ChatGPT or other tools. They've posted confidential information. And, and you know, I was just saying before the interview, I have a two and a half year old daughter. She's like a large language model. When you say something, she doesn't forget it. You can't get her to forget it. So if I say a bad word, if I'm, if I'm assembling some flat pack furniture and I say something wrong, I can't do that in front of her because I can't delete it and say forget it. It's the same thing with a large language model. Once you've put that stuff out there, you can't retract it. You can't email OpenAI and say, please delete this. The, the AI has learned it. So really being very careful about what data we put outside into these large language models, making sure that it's not confidential, making sure it's not personal identifiable, and making sure it's not part of, of, of AI training. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, sort of uh, traditional sort of security and privacy principles that we uh, can apply to in this AI era. But there's also obviously new ones, like you just mentioned. Some of this uh, information that we feed into AI models uh, cannot be easily uh, removed um, or, or deleted. So those are some, sort of the emerging new principles uh, that we need to also uh, be aware of.